Okay, so I'm an experimentalist. So uh, I will be talking more for, I'll describe our experiments in the last 15, 20 years. But I will be focused toward everything that I'll talk now, which will be very brief, basically. The second talk tomorrow will get on it, and the third one. So you have here sort of uh, the subject that I'll be talking about. First of all, I have some repetition. It did help me a lot, but I'll, I'll do quickly because I, I didn't want to start plugging transparencies out now. Um, but I will move into the fractional regime also. And maybe you'll cover it next time, no? OK. So, so I'll talk first uh, just types of modes, OK? Uh, and then I will move on using these modes for interference. And then the last one will be I'll talk about thermal transport, uh, which was done most recently. I think it's, this is one of the most uh, fascinating experiments that we ever did, which is still with results which are still controversial which we can talk about it, right? OK, so, so first of all, 2D. 2D electrons have been used for, for years. And everything that the industry is using now is 2D electrons in all your transistors, if you don't know. Okay, all your transistors are called MOSFETs, and they're around two-dimensional electron gas in silicon. Okay? The electrons are relatively high mobility, not so in silicon, and you can control them by a gate. Okay? So this is the, the call now, it's called HEMT or ModFET or whatever. Now, we are more interested in, in the exchange statistics of this thing. As you go, you mean that you don't hear me? I thought it's only a question. <laughs> OK, is it better? OK, thanks. So, so the main, the main effort of my group is mostly to drive into and see, let's call it exotic states. Exotic states are, are mostly in the fraction quantum whole regime. But when the first two speakers talked about the integer as something that we understand and trivial, well, I'll show you the next talk that we do some integer and we really don't understand results that we see there. So there is a lot of room also to do to work on the integer regime. OK, so I'll go very quickly. What, what it's, it's clear for everybody, exchange statistics, we know there are bosons, there are electrons, I mean bosons and, and fermions, right? And they have different statistics. However, if you just go around, then you find the same phase, okay? If you go all around one another, which is re basically interference. That's what I'll discuss next time. And, well, well these are all this, uh, you know, cliche stuff. And then if you move now to 2D, then we get, we can get anionic statistics, okay? And in this case, you don't necessarily have to have pi or two pi upon exchange, okay? You can have a phase, okay? However, uh, uh, it doesn't really matter. The order of, of permutation is not important here, okay? And when we move later on to, to anionic statistics, which is non-abelian, which I'll go, I'll talk about in the very last part, and I hope the theorists will talk about it before me and explain the theory behind it. Then, then what you find is that, that you really don't have to add a phase, okay? I'm sorry about this R, so I'm not supposed to be there. But, uh, but you can, you move to another state in the highly degenerate ground state. So basically you have a matrix, and when you change the order of permutation, you, you change the order of matrices, and you see the, these are not the same. That's the reason it's called non-abelian. OK, so basically we study anions, which in general can be also electrons in the quantum wall regime. So repetition of what had been done before, this is classical, OK? And then I usually use, when I, when I go to the quantum regime, I use not the Landau gauge mostly, but I use a symmetric gauge that gives us the same type of of, of, of Landau levels that are circles around because I like to talk about interference. But this is what happens usually that elections go around, probably uh, 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 around localized impurities. As you go to the edge, you get this skipping orbit, okay? And you see right away the chirality of this, and you can see right away also that these guys are, as you see in a second, are quite immune, okay? So we keep going on, and the question before, and, I Steve, and Steve talked about it before, what determines the width of the plateaus. Okay, so you can see here that that uh, ideal system, infinite mobility, no scattering whatsoever, then you have delta function of the Landau level, and then the chemical potential, 
I'm sorry, let's call it E-Fermi. The E-Fermi is basically the, the chemical potential which depends on the, the, the different people call theorists theory trying to call it chemical potential, I like, try to call it E-Fermi, which is the conduction band potential plus the chemical potential. Anyhow, whatever you change, if you change the density, the energy, you can be or here, or here, or here, you jump around and you don't see any plateaus whatsoever. And this is the, the way we define the feeling factor. And if you want to have plateaus, you need some disorder. Okay? And this disorder here gives you here many, many, many localized states, except at the center of the lambda level. Okay? So if the Fermi level sits somewhere here, okay, then you're sitting on a plateau. Okay? And you can think about it, if you sit somewhere here, somewhere in the gap here, there is no, there is no way to dissipate at all, right? Because you sit in a gap or in a or, or, or mobility gap, if you wish, and there is no way to, to, to lose energy because everything below is occupied. Again, the same thing, RH is basically our whole is, in Hall effect, the R whole is the number of free carriers, right? Proportion one over the free carriers. And, there is, and if you change this Fermi energy here, the number of free carriers doesn't change, you get a plateau. So th there are many ways to look at it, okay? Okay. So, so here, of course, you can see there are plateaus, etc. And then if you have too many, you have too many, too many impurities, the very the dirty sample, then everything merges together, and it's bad again. So you need semi-dirty. Okay. So here is, again, the, the same picture that, that, uh, that uh, Steve showed before. This is the Landau level. They came up. Okay, there are populated state and unpopulated state. And then what we showed before, that the conductance is, is quantized. Okay, and these are the edge state. These are the Landau level curving to the edge. This is a very simplified picture. There is this schlovsky glasman uh, uh, Shlovsky picture that talks about interactions also, and then this picture is not correct. Okay, but in general, it's enough for us now. Okay. I just want to, to mention to you all, as, as Steve showed before, that the conductance is an integral basically of the energy, mu1 minus mu2. So it really doesn't matter. The electric field can sit here, and there's no reason it should be here. This is bulk. So if you apply some voltage between this part and this part, delta EF here, then the electric field can be all over, and the current can be not only at the edge, but also in the bulk. However, this, this current is, is non dissipative. Okay, because it goes below, there is no, 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 no empty space to lose energy. So the only one that can lose energy are this one. Okay, and this is what we call the net bulk current. Okay, okay so we talked about these edge states about ballistic. Well, if they are ballistic, how come they are dissipated? How come we, at all we have E square over H if they are ballistic? You know, ballistic, there is no loss of energy. Yet, there is loss of energy at the contacts, right? Okay. So here is, the, I think, a beautiful experiment by the group of Voklitzing, okay, in 1991, when he has these two ugly things, or two ohmic contacts, a voltage here applied relative to the voltage here, okay? And this sample, which is in the Hall effect, was immersed in helium just below the surface of the helium. And you can see here, this is the direction of the current. Let's say this is the chirality. This is the direction of the current. You see the current left here with EV. Didn't lose any energy here. Okay, and lost the whole energy when it came down to the ground. And, he, and this part was heated up, okay, and you could see a bubble by eye or by a microscope of a helium bubble. So it boiled the helium. I think it's, it's a beautiful experiment, right? Chosu. And I, I'll use this thing in a in, in few minutes, okay? These are what we call here hot spots, okay? Okay, so the dissipation is, is, is happen on the, at the corners, at the contacts themselves. Okay, so why do we study edge mode at all? Okay, because the bulk in general, which is kind of obvious to everybody, is not so accessible. It's, it's in ins insulating, okay? So it's very, what, what can you do? Okay, you can, you, can, you can look on localized states, I suppose, by local probing, etc. You can possibly look on some compressibility, etc. But it's very easy to measure, to, to test the edges, okay? Because current runs at the edges. And what, what, what uh, uh, Charlie mentioned before, there is this beautiful thing, which is this is edge, bulk edge correspondence, that from the edge, which can be ugly and very funny in shape, you can learn a lot about the wave function in the bulk, okay? In a way, this is sort of like the stock theory, okay? That you look around and you find something that what goes inside, inside, the, inside the bulk. Okay, so first, 
the measurement that, that uh, Klaus did was not really to change Steve B, but he changed the density, okay, if you look at the paper. So he changed the density and not the magnetic field, and this is the Nobel Prize paper, basically, okay? So I won't stay on it much longer, and lucky guys, okay, this guy just took the, the magnetic field higher, looking for Wigner crystal at the time, and they found the one cell. This was a relatively easy Nobel Prize, I would say. Okay, so, so they find the one cell, but they were smart enough even to say something, you know, that, you know, using the Laughlin argument for the integer regime, this argument leads to quasi-particle with Feitner charge. And Laughlin later on, well, I'm sorry that this, this jumped too early, but he said the same thing, electrical, you know, uh, uh, fractional charge. That's what he claimed, and, he, and his argument was the argument exactly what both speakers before did, for, you know, same thing, you, you add flux quanta, okay, and you create an electric field going around, okay, which is, this is the, the EMF, that this is the electric field, one, this is the EMF, and this is the electric field, azimuthal electric field, and then you have now charge density, which is the conductance time the electric field, and then you integrate around to get the current, okay, the charge that moves out is E over three. In this particular field, in fact, of one over three. This was a, a Laughlin argument for a charge of E over three in the system. Okay, and here, the number of flux quanta is, is now here. You have, for example, in one third, you have three flux quanta, per an electron. That means one cell Fini factor. Okay, you can see with time that the uh, results of, of the two first experiment of uh, Klaus von Klitzing and Stormer et al. changed, and now you can see many, many fractions and even more fractions today as before. This is in with time. This, this plot is, it was measured at a much later time where the quality of the material was vastly improved. Okay, what I want now to spend a bit of time, nobody talks about it because we just take the material, you know, gallium arsenide look black if you look at it, okay? And you make contact and you walk, but nobody knows what goes inside. So I want to spend a few minutes to tell you that it's not so easy to get these very high mobility, very nice samples. Talk for 10 minutes, five minutes about MBE, okay? Okay, okay so first it's, there are maybe 2,000 systems all over the world of molecular beam epitaxis, which is basically a, a, a highly pumped, very high vacuum chamber, extremely clean, with very pure material, and it's basically evaporation of materials, okay? Okay, the system that we have in our place, we have three systems in Weizmann, and, and the high mobility sample is operated by Vladimir Romansky, who's one of the maybe four growers in the world that are making this high mobility. So among these thousands of systems, very, very few create very high mobility uh, uh, material. So you see here, if you understand a bit in pressure, this is, you see, very, very low pressure, and the growth rate is about one monolayer per hour. At temperature of the substrate, which is about 600 degrees, atoms move around, and they stick around cleave edges, okay, and, and sort of like a monolayer by a monolayer cover the surface. Okay, now the 2D gas itself, which was also, it was called modulation doping when it was in 1978, also by the groups, by the Bell group at the time, was to take high gap material and put it near a low gap material. At the same time, move the impurities away. Scattering is mostly by, at low temperature by impurities. And you need impurities, donors for example, that will provide electrons to the system, but they are, if they sit in the same vicinity, then of course electrons will scatter. So separate the donors from the electrons, okay? So you take, you move the, the uh, you put, a, make a heterojunction, okay? And then you put electron or donors, in this particular case, they are most of the time silicon, okay? Electrons come out and find a place to come down, okay? And low, then you go down to the lowest energy. And then you have now a capacitor, right? A charge capacitor, a donors on the left which are positive, because they are naked of electrons, the electron on the right, and you have now an electric field, and usually the well is kind of a triangular well. You don't have to, you can, as you will see later, you can make also a real quantum well, like a square quantum well, but this is like a one-side doped two-dimensional electron gas. And now you see the donors are far away, there is a spacer, 
and the electrons are sitting here, and they are moving into the board. If this surface is very pure, up to a monole pure and, and abrupt, okay, then there is, there's not much scattering. I'll show you the, the scattering in a second along the edge. Okay, and then the, uh, if this is the number of impurities in the bulk. So you can see that the number of impurity in the bulk per centimeter cube, as the number goes down and down and down, the highest possible mobility increases, okay? Okay, here it's mostly phonons, okay? And at, at the end here is mostly impurities. And this is high mobility, but not the highest. This was, this, this is done for 5, 10 to the 13. And to get high mobility, you have to go even less to 5, 10 to the 13 per centimeter cube. Yes? Yes, it can be also measured in a bulk material. Here I cannot measure it, but in a bulk material, because if you have now 10 to the 13 and you take a bulk, the depletion from the surface, because of surface state is huge, so you have to grow many microns to be able to measure the density of this material. Yeah. Okay, so, so basically what we do, we have here these donors, these are the electrons, okay, and here, these are types of, in this case, interferometers that we build from the surface, okay? So we put gates on the surface, we deplete, <coughs> we etch to deplete, etc. Okay. So now, just you can see the number of the, the possible causes of disorder or, or scattering in the system, which you can sort of add them approximately in this way. Okay, so there are remote ionized impurity that sit in the aluminum gallium arsenide, there is this disorder of the donors themselves that affect the potential below, okay? Because the distance here is a few hundred angstroms, usually. Alloy scattering, because the wave function of the electron penetrates into the aluminum gallium arsenide, and there is disorder because aluminum sits every three atoms or so in a random fashion, so there is scattering. Background impurity in the gallium arsenide itself, and then, of course, always phonon scattering. <coughs> Okay, lucky now, for us, most of, the, most of the donors here become very, very, very deep. They are called DX centers, okay? When you go to low temperature, the donor basically freeze, namely the electron that remains and do not move anywhere. And there is no so-called parallel conduction. I'll fight with it later, and I'll show you later on something a bit different, okay? Okay, so now this is the dependence of mobility in a spacer. Of course, if the spacer is very, very large, the donors are very far away, the density goes down of the electron and there is less screening, okay? And if it's too nearby, the, the donors affect it. So there is some optimum number that the mobility is highest. Again, in this particular case, it was only a few million, but it was measured at four, four Kelvin, okay? A as you will see in a minute, if you go down to millikelvin, the, the, uh, the mobility goes much higher. This is even at 300 millikelvin. Okay, so now, the push for, for higher and higher mobility led, this was Lauren Pfeiffer that came up with this idea from, at the time, Bell Laboratory, now in Princeton, that one can now dope a well from both sides, okay, and put electrons here. But now we want to, to have here minimum amount of disorder. We want to have correlation in the donor layer, okay? So if we put it in this silicon in aluminum gallium arsenide, these donors have been frozen at about 100 Kelvin, and the thermal agitation at 100 Kelvin makes the donor, uh, the ionized donor, very non-ordered. Okay, there is a lot of scattering. So the idea was the following, and this just follow with me just for, for a minute or so. So here is gallium arsenide, and this is aluminum arsenide. Okay, the aluminum arsenide has also the, the gamma band is the gamma band in gallium arsenide. Okay, and the gamma band, this is the gallium arsenide sitting here. Okay, and the aluminum arsenide, okay, has an, I, mean, I am plotting only the X band, the gamma band is very high, forget about it. The aluminum arsenide is an indirect uh, gap, uh, it has an indirect gap, and, and, and here is the, 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 the uh, X valley of the, of the, of in the gallium arsenide and in the aluminum gallium arsenide. So now here, you have these electrons here, and here is the X valley here in the aluminum arsenide, and the well is narrow enough, so the, the, the gamma band is being pushed up, it's, there is a quantization, and the electrons here sit here, okay? Um, the electron in, in, in here, in the donor layer, and then the electron fall down here. So now you have here are the donors, empty, okay? Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. 
Here, here are the donors sitting empty here, and the, and the electron move down here. So now you have this layer and this layer, heavy electron in the aluminum arsenide X band, they can move around, okay? But you don't want them to move around because this will create parallel conduction. At, few mi at 10, 20, 30, 50 millikelvin, the mass is very high and they are semi-localized and barely move, okay? Maybe the mobility is one or 10 or 100, which is much, much smaller than a million of mobility. So there is very little parallel conduction, but they arrange themselves to screen the electrons best. Okay, that's what I'm writing here. Electrons spill over to the aluminum arsenide X valley on these two sides, okay? Electrons are mobile, but very low mobility. And that, as a result, you get a very effective screening of the donor inside. Okay, so now look, you can get now mobility. The mobility that our, the, our group got is about 36 million, which gives you about, about 300 micron to 500 micron mean free path between impurities. So almost half a millimeter electron can go at low temperature, below 0.3 Kelvin, with no interaction with impurities. Okay, and this is just to, to explain to you donor, donor correlations, okay? So, so if you, now we are overdoping even. I'm sorry that I'm going a little bit, but I'm finishing it in, in, in a minute or two. I even dope more the donor layers, okay? So here, for example, if I have minimum donors, all of them gave electrons out, okay? So you see there is some disorder here. And here there are many more that are needed, okay? So now if you look at it again, you see now that the, the extra one, okay, the extra one are sitting here. Now you have only many more donors, but, but fewer of them sitting. These are the, basically the, the plus, and this is the minuses, and there is much more correlation here. I, I can talk to you later because I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the half, if you look on Fini factor half, which is sort of like a barometer, there is, no, there is no whole state in this particular, uh, in particular one, but the minimum goes down as the, as the mobility goes up, okay? <clears throat> okay, I move on from here and I move now to the experimental work. This is sort of a whole bar that most of the measurements are being done, okay? Just, you have the 2D gas, you etch it, you put contacts here, okay? And you make the experiment. And this is just to flesh what I'm going to talk about maybe in the third lecture about this, this excited Landau level, first excited Landau level, just shows you this even denominator state with Rx x equal zero, which was very difficult to obtain in the past. Okay, <clears throat> let's talk about types of modes. Okay, so integer we already talked about, okay? The fractional one are really of, are two few types. Particle-like, which you know, you heard before maybe, whole conjugate state, I'll define in a minute, which are above half, between half and one, I'm talking about the lowest Landau level, and non-abelian state, projected, okay, to be five, five, five halves, maybe 12 fifths, and maybe more. <coughs> okay, now, there is a chirality for the edge modes, okay? So the, I, we, I will be calling down, downstream mode, which are particle-like, okay? And there is downstream and upstream mode. Most of the time, the upstream modes are neutral. And this happens in the non-abelian state and in the whole conjugate states. <coughs> Let me just st stop on it for a second. There are modes in the system that can go counter-propagating because the velocity depends on the electric field. If the electric field is opposite, then the electrons or quasi-particles, whatever, can move in the opposite direction, okay? Now, as you will see in a bit, the work of, of Charlie in the past, etc. there are many things that I'm talking about that rely from Charlie's work between 1994 and 1997, okay, about <coughs> measuring charge and the appearing of neutral modes. So the neutral modes are these modes that are many a times moving the opposite direction, and they are invisible when you try to measure conductors. <coughs> Okay, so, so here, are, 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 here I'm trying to show you counter-propagating modes. Okay, so this guy, this is what I call a whole conjugate state between half and one, and the same thing in the, in the second Landau level, spin split Landau level, and this is what I call particle-like state, or Laughlin, Laughlin uh, quasi-particles. So what I'll talk now, <coughs> basically I'll talk, I'll use current fluctuations or short noise to show you the power of this thing. Not too many groups in the world are you measuring short noise, even though it's not too difficult at all. 
So it's beyond me to understand why, okay? Because it's, it's very powerful in determining many things here. As you will see, I'll give you a couple of examples here. Okay, so Schottner started in 1918 by Schottky. He was smart enough to see fluctuation in vacuum tubes, okay, that, that produced first by J.J. Thompson, okay? And then the current, he found the current to be noisy. <coughs> and what happens there is that you have sort of like a, a limit of a binomial distribution, a Poisson distribution. There is a large number of impinging electrons at a hot cathode, and only very few escape. Okay, so you have a large number with a tiny probability to get out. And this is, is, is sort of very beautiful paper, which gives you, which you probably know from classical physics, which is two times E times I. And this spectral density is basically measured with amp square per hertz, or volt square per hertz. Okay, so I just, what, what was new after this? <coughs> What's so special about a, a Fermi system? And this, uh, this is, was a very, important paper by Lesovic, and before this clues about this paper, we didn't even know. It was in, in, in Russian, it, it wasn't translated at the time. Okay, that talks about what is the noise in a full Fermi C. Okay, so you see this is 1989, and I remember being in Santa Barbara, and people were arguing, how can it be the discrete particles that are moving around do not have any noise, right? They are discrete particles, yeah, bang, 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 should have noise, but you don't. That was his prediction, okay? And this was the first experiment we did in order to prove it. So first of all, if you look basically on, on the wave package picture, okay? So suppose I apply a small voltage, and then each electron occupy this particular length in time, okay? And if you increase the voltage, you, you, go f you just make the wave packet narrower and narrower, etc. But if you now combine all these things together, you find out, and this is not from the picture here, but when you calculate it correctly, you find out that all this overlapping of wave function, which is basically this wave function, or we've, sorry, wave packages, they have sign x over x, basically. If you put them one on top of the other, you get a flat current with zero noise, which was very surprising until 1990. Okay. So in order, in, and this is a zero temperature, of course. In order now to get noise, you have to partition the beam. Okay. You have to pluck out electrons or whatever it is, okay? And in this case, when the probability is very, very small to get through, you get two EI, this is the Schottky formula. But if now uh, uh, you have T which is not very, not very, this T very small, and if the T is now medium or close to one, then you have this correction of one minus T. And you can see when T is equal, when T is equal zero, okay? Then you have your two EI. And when T is equal to 1, there is no noise at all. OK. OK. So now, why, why is it important? So this is sort of a picture to show you <coughs> that here are an example, which doesn't really exist so simply. But so, suppose you have an electron. And by some Coulomb interaction, those are separated in space from to, from to another. You see that the conductance that you'll measure here will be E square over 3. OK? E square over th uh, 3H. OK? OK. So now, if you have now this, this now, we go now to the fraction, if you partition it now and you measure noise, you will get now here E star. I'm sorry, the conductor, yeah, the e, because you pluck electron at a time, you'll get now E, okay? If you have now this, again, picture of this beam of noiseless e, e over three, okay, the conductors will be the same, but if you partition, you'll get now E star, okay? If you make, uh, you look on the, on the, on the noise. So conductance doesn't tell you anything about the fractional charge, or about the value of the charge, OK? So Laughlin, with his argument about proof of flux quanta, you're supposed to get it, et cetera, but one has to prove it. And this, the, our work for here was really motivated here by the work so here of, of Charlie, OK, Charlie et al., and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Charlie and, and, and uh, Matthew Fisher, that talked about, suggested really to have very weak partitioning here and measure the charge. OK, I just want to add now just, just one more thing here that, why that? OK, so it, we always measure something at finer temperature, OK? So one has to integrate now of, of, the Fermi, uh, of the two Fermi Cs on the left or on the right, OK? So first of all, if you don't apply any voltage, you get this famous, you know, 4 kTG. This is the thermal noise, the thermal, the Johnson-Nyquist noise, OK? And if now you are having 
t equals zero and only noise, you get this formula of which we call excess, a short noise. And the reasons that I call later on excess noise, because I, when I measure excess noise, I measure the noise above the 4 kTG. And this becomes now ugly, OK? So this is just an integral of the Fermi statistics, et cetera, OK? okay? So you get now something that looks different, OK? And I'll show you, show you the result in soon. So how do you partition electrons? I think that you probably know about the quantum point contact. So it's like two, two gates that deplete electrons underneath and then deplete the area in between them as we wish by changing the gate voltage, okay? So we can change the transmission between zero and one. Okay, and here an example of, of this quantum point contact that, that might have inside modes that are going through, one or two or three modes, okay? Okay, and you can see now that the prediction, okay, is that at the plateau, a full mode is going through, and, and suppose we are sitting now at thin factor three, Okay, so if I sit here, okay, the voltage gate is this way, so I have one mode go through and two are fully reflected. So there is no partitioning. There is a full beam and two reflected again. So the noise is supposed to be now as you see here. Okay, the noise of this is T1 minus T at half, it's maximum. Okay, and this is our, I'm sorry about this, this is our first experiment that was done at high temperature. I'm not going to elaborate anymore, so I'm going to continue. That Resnikov and also the group of, of uh, Glatley was measuring at the time just to show indeed that this at the plateau, the noise is minimum. Okay, <clears throat> and here is just again no magnetic field here whatsoever. You measure here the charge, this is the temperature, this is the transmission, and I, don't, I wouldn't say that this is the best way to measure the charge of the electrons, okay, because there is some uncertainties here, but you can see how beautiful you get here, and this is, this is the lower part at low temperature, at the, the, at the tells you about the temperature, that you can get from here the temperature of the electrons, and this straight line suggests that this formula works very, very nice. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the quantum Hall effect. Okay, so, so now we have, let's say in this particular case, we have now thinning factor one, two, three, four, five, okay? And you can see that I can pass a, a full edges, you know, the outermost edges. I can reflect or partition Okay, the edges that come from, from here are the hot one, and the edges that come from here are the cold one, right? These are the two parts, and, and by reflecting, I go from the hot one to the cold one. Maybe I should have drawn it in different colors, okay? And then I have the other two modes that are totally reflected. So I can, by simply change the gate voltage, partition any, ch any, any channel that I want among a number of channels, okay? And now the other thing that we do here, mostly we are usually don't measure it by two terminal. You can also measure, you can put two terminal, like Steve showed you before, one terminal here, another terminal here, and a quantum point contact, and the current here will fluctuate, okay? If you have here a voltage source, the current here will fluctuate, okay? But the point is that if it fluctuates, then, then, uh, and you change the transmission, okay? The transmission itself is, is nonlinear, Usually, I'll show you uh, uh, an example. But when you have now, I'll show you uh, in a minute how the amplifier is connected and what do we do. But the amplifier here that measure the current that comes here, it measure the voltage with between here and ground, okay? So the current, the, the, the fluctuating current comes here and it applies a voltage I square times R whole square because it's kind of fluctuations, okay? And this, and our, our hole is a constant number, okay? So it's very easy to measure it because our hole doesn't change, okay? Okay, it's constant. And on the other hand, if you measure between here and here, this comes into the how hole itself. Okay, so we measure, we take the transmission here, we want to partition it very little, somewhere up here, and here we measure the noise. Okay, so I want to stress something that I didn't know in the very initial age. When, when, I, when somebody say you measure the charge of the edge or the charge of particles at the edge, this is not a true statement because the edge itself has no charge. The edge itself has a plasma wave that goes out from left to right. You measure the charge in the cube quantum point contact that scatters from the hot to the cold, okay? And, and it measures basically the property of the gap of the quantum point contact. And you will see here that the slight backscattering means that the, 
that the thinning factor in the, inside the QPC between these two parts is very close to, let's say, one third. So you measure eventually one third. If you go to pinch it off and you go to vacuum in, in there, you can also scatter from one side to another. The charge that you will measure will be different. And this also appeared in Charlie's paper in 1994. Okay, so here that's exactly what I'm saying here again. It's just that if you have here strong scattering, then you get E over three. And this is not a good representation maybe of the, of the quantum point contact. And if you have very weak coupling, then you go through vacuum if you wish. And, and you cannot have now two thirds of electron and one third electron here in the bulk. That's another way to look at it. Okay, so for example, if I sit here at a, at a finite factor of four nines, okay, and I go with my quantum point contact, you can see all these plateaus, okay, that I reflect back, okay, and then you ca you, if you want to measure, as we did, okay, you have to put your quantum point contact at this point here when the transmission is very close to unity of this particular. A, a, a fini factor. Okay, so now just three experimental considerations. Okay. So the short noise signal that you measure is in the range of 10 to the minus 29 amps per, per hertz. It means nothing to you, but it's basically like the, the Johnson Nyquist noise for fini factor one, let's say, at about 40 millikelvin. That's the noise that you measure, actually, noise that you'll measure of the, uh, uh, to me when you measure the, the quasi particle charge. The Johnson noise is the temperature of your fridge, okay? So it's 10 to 30. But then if you want to use some warm electronics outside sitting to measure the noise, then the temperature is very, very high, okay? So it's very difficult to take, pull this out from this high temperature. So what we and others did that we are having our own homemade cryogenic amplifier that sits inside the fridge. You cannot put it at a 10 millikelvin stage because it's, it dissipates a lot of power. It will heat up the fridge. So you put it on, on the 1K plate or the 4.2K plate, and then the temp effective temperature of this amplifier is an order of magnitude smaller than this and better. And then you, and you want to work, as you will see in a minute, at a high free, relatively high frequency above the 1 over F noise. OK. okay. But if you take now your, your device, your whole bar, and you connect it now to the amplifier at 4.2, you have a coaxial cable. The coaxial cable has some 60 picofarad of 60 centimeter. And then if you look on the RC time constant, you see that everything will be killed down, okay, at about 30 kilohertz. Everything will be shorted at about 30 kilohertz. Smack at the one over F tail. So what we do, we add a coil, okay, to this capacitance, the, the coax capacitance, and we push the frequency up from 30 kilohertz to about few megahertz or half a megahertz or something like this, above the one over F tail, okay? And that's not only us, whoever does it, that's the way they work. Okay, and now let's go to the results right away. So you can see that if you want to measure very nicely the noise, okay, at one third and get from there the charge, you can see I, this is the transmission of the quantum point contact, and you see here that the transmission here is very close to unity. It's 0.99, even though you don't have to do it, okay? But then th this, the data measured at 9 millikelvin agrees very, very nicely with the charge E over 3. If you now pinch the QPC further, you see, now it starts, this behaves sort of like a Lattinger liquid, even though it does not agree with it, okay? You start with, a, with, with pinching it off to about 0.1, as you increase the voltage and the current in order to measure the 2EI, you have to increase the DC current. You see now that the transmission is very, very nonlinear. If you measure the noise, initially it starts, okay, because it's very pinched off. That's exactly what Charlie in the paper wrote also. We go through a vacuum type area between the two, the two hole, between the two edges in the quantum point contact. You get E, close to E. And when you come now to, to a high transmission, you start getting something parallel to E over 3. If you just measure the evolution of, of, the, of the charge as a function of, of, uh, of pinching, so if it's open at all, this is a few devices, okay? If you open it all the way or barely open, you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.8 or something like that, you get E over 3, okay? And as you pinch it off, you approach 1. Okay, how can it be half a charge? Well, it is just a, a statistical average between one third 
and two thirds possibly, and, 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 and one, because you can have not necessarily one third, you can have two thirds, you can have a bunch of two quasi particles and three quasi particles, eventually one. Okay? So you get all this curve moving from one to another, but this is not universal, it depends really on the details of the experiment. Now, here is something else which for us was a surprise. Okay? So here is the two fifths. Which is, I am, which is the second composite fermion Landau level, okay? And if you measure it at very high temperature, you get E over 5. But if you go down to the same 9 millikelvin, you get 2 E over 5, okay? Namely, what you see here, that the charge that you measure evolves from high temperature to low temperature. I don't think this was predicted before. And correct me if I'm wrong, Charlie, okay? So this was a surprise for us. And just anecdotally, I want to tell you a little story about it. When we measured E over 3 in 1996 or 7, okay, we didn't have this low temperature fridge. We didn't know how to cool the electrons down. So we measured at about 50 or 60 millikelvin. So we measured E over 3. And then the community say, well, you measure maybe the filling factor. Go to, go to 2 fifths, show us that you get 1 fifths. So we went to 2 fifths at a relatively high temperature, and you measure 1 fifths. And the Nobel Prize was given a few months later, 1998. Okay? But if we would measure the two fifths at low temperature like today, we would measure two fifths. I don't know if they will get the Nobel Prize. Anyhow, so there is a, a, a peculiar, and, if, and again, what, what I said also later on, that if what you measure here, that at three, at three sevens, which I don't want to show you, you measure three sevens at very, very low temperature. So, yes, yes. At high temperature, it's 17. It climbs up, almost approach, but I think it needs less than 9 millikelvin. So it reaches 2.5 almost, but not 3 seven, seven, 2.5 or So I, I, <coughs> I didn't see any theoretical paper that suggests that if you have one third, they would prefer through a very open QPC, namely transmission close to one, to have three of them coming, or two of, two of the two-fifths coming, to, two of the one-fifths coming together. So this is an interesting thing that I didn't see any explanation for it. <coughs> now I want to, to, to talk about whole conjugate states, okay, and neutral modes. Okay, so, so the expected one-third we know it's a simple edge, and as you will see, it's not so simple edge, okay? But it's one-third, it's a simple edge, supposedly simple edge, single downstream, one-third edge modes. Okay? But when you go to two-thirds, McDonald in 1992 already proposed that really you have a full Landau level and you have one-third holes inside. Okay? <clears throat> so you get one minus one-third. Okay? So the fact of this, you see right away that you should have two counter-propagating. And you can see from here, okay, this is the filling factor. You can see here that the electric field here is opposite to the electric field here. So you have two counter-propagating modes. Okay? And then what do we expect to see? If indeed you have one is core over H, <coughs> this is, let's say, this is the hot part, and that's the cold one, so forget about it. And that's the one third going back. It comes from the cold, forget about it. But here is the one third. So what will be the two probe conductance? The two probe conductance in the naive model should be four thirds. Can you see it? Because it will be one plus one third. Okay? However, nobody measured four thirds. Okay? Four. Okay? So upstream mode was also not found by, by work of Ashuri that he looked for upstream plasma wave going in the two-third mode. Okay. So nobody saw this, and I think this triggered also Charlie to go ahead and develop the theory of neutral modes. So I'm not going to go over it because I don't understand fully the paper anyhow. Okay. But what happens is that there is exchange of particles, equilibration between the one and minus one-third. Okay. <clears throat> and what happens eventually is that you get here, this is schematically, you have two third, one minus one third, downstream mode, that's what we measure, two third, and upstream there is neutral mode. So this paper from 1997 was sitting there and nobody measured the neutral mode because it's not so difficult to measure energy mode going upstream, okay? <clears throat> so why, why neutral mode is so important? And in my next talks it will appear again and again and again, okay? They are not observed in charge transport measurement. They carry energy with no net charge. I look at it as dipoles moving, okay? They are possible source of dephasing of interference, which I'll show you next talk, okay? And, and they are also topological. You must have 
okay? If the two thirds have two modes going counter-propagating, I don't care which types they are, okay? Except, uh, except parafermion or something like this. If it's one and minus one third, or it's two third and, 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 and neutral, they're supposed always to cancel each other. But we'll talk about it uh, next time, or the time after next. <coughs> okay, so, so detection method over the years, we, you, our group mostly measure shock noise again, okay? And there are other groups that measured it, or us, us measure it by heating. So you can come and heat a quantum dot, for example, and you can see the peak of the, of the resonance of the quantum dot broadens out. So they are there, and we know how to measure it now. Okay, so the motivation I wrote here, this is the earliest experiment, that's the first experiment we did, just to give you a feel, is that they are looking, the motivation we had, that we have a dipole in a way, it's a charge that does, there's no net current at all. And if I bring it to the QPC, maybe I'll, I'll fragment it, okay? Maybe I'll have plus minus or minus plus, okay? Maybe I'll have sort of, sometimes I'll have the minus going through, sometimes the plus, but the net current will be zero. Indeed, this was the case. <coughs> so how do we, here is a simple experiment. So this is now a, a homey contact. You put some current here. The chirality is this way. You see, the chirality is this way, going here. And here, there is this, you remember this hot spot I showed you before? The back side of the contact, you have hot spot. So this hot spot now can excite the neutral mode if it is there, okay? So that if it, it can be moving around, being non-excited. But you need some energy from somewhere, so you have heat dissipation here. Usually, it's half of the power that you put into the contact dissipates here and you come here as this neutral modes, and then if this QPC fragments it, okay, then you will get here this electron hole charge moving in this direction. But sometimes electron, sometimes a hole, sometimes electron, sometimes a hole, and you'll measure here noise. And that's what you did, okay, that's what we did. So you can see here that as we change it now, this is the transmission of the QPC, of the quantum point contact, okay? So as you change it, you make it smaller, you make it smaller, it goes about, up, and then you go up, it goes back down, it behaves like T1 minus T. Okay, I don't understand exactly why, but that's uh, the way it behaves like, very much like, like short noise of a, of, of, of a current that comes in. Okay. <clears throat> another way, <clears throat> now I'm basically coming to the end, another way now to, to excite it is not necessarily at the back side of an ohmic contact, but at the quantum point contact. Okay, so here you can come now with, with a charge mode, Okay, the chirality is now moving this way again. You come with a charge mode, and then you partition it here. But usually the quantum point contact in, a, in a, where there is no neutral mode at all, okay, when it doesn't exist at all, is, is elastic, okay? But here, it transfers from here to here, and it dissipates energy because there is a neutral mode there, and the neutral mode here is, is, is the, 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 the charge that goes here, and the neutral mode goes upstream, and then you measure noises with amplifier sitting here. And here again, similar graph that I showed you before, okay, and the dependence of T1 minus T. Okay, so I think that I'll, I'll stop now here, okay, because I talked, uh, talked about this neutral mode, how important they are. I want to move now next time to talk about interference, okay, and show you the problem of measuring interference and the fact that except one experiment until now, uh, uh, we didn't see any time interference of fractional charge, okay? And, and what we think is responsible for this is the appearance of neutral modes. Okay, I'll stop here, thank you. <laughs> any questions? Thank mm -hmm. you.